Now to introduce our star of the evening, which is my dear friend Deb, who known for far too many years, <laughs> has been friend, neighbour, uh, conciliary, she's been here for me, everything. And uh, we've walked along an interesting road together from time to time, Debs and I. Debs is a psychic, a very good psychic, uh, a healer, she's a nature lover, and she spends any spare moment she's got rescuing animals. Well, not just animals, anything that moves. Uh, I've known Debs pick up, get rats and take them out into the forest. <laughs> uh, to rescue a bee, and then if there's even a, a gnat sitting there, somebody's going to squash it, she'll rescue and rush it outside. So, an absolute nature lover, and um, she she does her, her work mainly is the readings that she does um, in healing. So, she uses a system for healing called CKT which she was taught by a master, a lovely man we knew very well. And she's running, she helps support the CKT group now. Debbie will probably tell you a little bit more of what CKT is if you're interested. It's, um, it's a kinesiology type based, uh, dowsing type based way of finding out what's the underlying problem for you and if you suffer from allergies or know anybody who suffers from allergies i really recommend you connect to debbie um, for a session she also does great um, psychic readings so both of those things i can really recommend of you is both fabulous and if you want to find out more about debbie's work on that side um, it's nature's message .co.uk. Now, she has a great passion in life, and that is nature. And she has a dream, and she has a, a, a very special dream with her boyfriend, Tom, who is here somewhere pretending to be a wizard. <laughs> He's not uh, pretending, he really is one. Well, yes, she really is, a, is one. And he's <laughs> been, uh, he's he supports me all the time with my uh, website and, 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 and lots else as, as well. And um, their plan and dream and passion is to find some land and to set up a, a nature reserve and to eventually turn it into a place that other people can come and, and chill out and recover from any traumas or whatever they need, a, a quiet space in nature, which is totally unspoilt. Um, the idea is to, to find some, somewhere where they can put their stamp on it, but to bring the wildlife to its fullest and best situation. So I know, Debbie, it's going to be full of rescued hedgehogs, um, Stoats, foxes, <laughs> bees, I don't know. Anything that needs rescuing, it will be there. Because that's the way she is. And it's going to be a, a wildlife rescue centre. And it's, she has this project, which is, is um, starting soon, is called Earthkin. And if you want to find a little bit more about that, then you go to earthkin.org. So I think... That is all for me to say at the moment. We'll I'm going to pass on to Debbie now. And after Debbie's uh, spoken to you, she's going to lead us in a meditation for us to connect to nature. She's going to help us really feel nature and, and not just look at trees, but to feel the energy of the trees. So I'm going to leave her to tell you all about that. But after we've... Debbie's had her talk and she's answered your questions. We'll break into break up into breakout rooms so that you can you 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 two can share how you experience nature and and have a chat with somebody. And it's really nice for everybody to have a, a conversation with each other. Um, so we'll lead lead over to to you now, my darling, Debs. So I'm going Thank to you, do, Anne. I'm going to try and do something clever like. What did Tom do? <laughs> I think he's going to do something. Can you do it so that um, 
Tom, can you do it so that Debbie's full screen? Ah. Oh, oh, that's a bit scary. Well done. Thank you. Okay, Deb, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. And uh, hello, everybody. It's, it's lovely to see you all. And really lovely to see some familiar faces. So thank you for coming along. Um, I'll just actually uh, briefly mention CKT, which, which Anne talked about in her introduction. It stands for chirokinetic therapy. Um, and it's a, a treatment that is a combination of um, kinesiology, so muscle testing, but a very basic form of muscle testing um, and a chiropractic manoeuvre that is used to rebalance the body. So it's a way of communicating with the body, finding out where the imbalances are and then correcting those imbalances using this small chiropractic manoeuvre. Um, it was originally developed purely to, to treat allergies and help bring the body back into balance when there's an allergic reaction. But actually, um, we then developed it further so that um, it, 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 it's a much more holistic treatment and it, it deals with emotions and spiritual imbalance as well as physical. Um, I was practicing and teaching CKT, but um, I decided to, to throw my life in, in the air and leave the UK back in 2010, 2009, 2010. Um, and so I couldn't actually then work on anybody because, um, I, well, first of all, I was living in the jungle for a couple of years, looking after lots of dogs in a rescue centre, which is where I met my lovely Tom. Um, <clears throat> when I left Sri Lanka, <clears throat> excuse me, I came to Brittany in France because I had two rescue dogs um, and needed somewhere to be. So I ended up living in Brittany for a couple of years. And that's when I, I picked up my work again, but I couldn't actually physically meet people to do the, the treatment on them because I couldn't speak French. Um, so I developed a method of being able to do CK tea treatment using dowsing, using a pendulum rather than using a person's arm. Um, and that's when the other side started to come in for me um, and I just happened. Um, so so yeah, that's that's what CKT is, um, and that's what I do. But my my journey with with nature, I mean, the whole thing, of course, fits in together. Um, I've always been very lucky from the age of um, six when my my um, my my mum actually divorced my father when I was five, and from the age of six, we then. Um, we're living with my stepfather, who I call dad because he is my dad in every way. Um, we, we moved in with him and we moved on to a farm because he was a farmer. So suddenly we gone from living in a, a London tower block to living on a farm. And this was just the most amazing transformation. And my mum and I just absolutely loved it. Um, and we always had animals around us, endless dogs and cats. But we had this, this one particular dog um, called Gemma, who was a rough collie, you know, a lassie dog. And she was, um, she was everything to me. She, this dog absolutely saved my life um, because as the years went on, I did have some quite traumatic events from outside of the family that happened to me and Gemma this dog was the only being that I told she was my absolute one and only um, source of comfort and the being that I could confide in um, and she had this extraordinarily long nose and she just knew she just had this way of knowing when I was feeling sad and she would come up and she would just rest her nose in my hand just to tell me she was there um, so that was really <clears throat> one of the biggest experiences that I had with it, with another being, um, and it and it really it really uh, changed my whole attitude, I suppose, to animals. That realization that they're not that's not just a dog, 
you know that's that's a that's a being in there there's a spirit in there and she's connecting with me um but as always happens unfortunately when we love these furry family members um the time came when when Gemma had to go um and it was oh see I'm getting choked up already and this was like <laughs> 35 40 years ago <clears throat> but off off she went and I completely fell apart um, and actually began to contemplate suicide and I, I I came out in a huge rash all over my body and ended up going to the GP um, who told me that she, she well she was trying to diagnose this rash but she actually said I she thought it was an emotional reaction and and I blurted out that I was actually feeling suicidal and she sent me for some counseling um, which I have to say was not particularly helpful at the time because I couldn't express what I was feeling I couldn't speak it out loud um, so I was really in a desperate state. Now this all happened within a, a, a very short window, about two weeks of losing Gemma. Um, and within two weeks, this gentleman that used to come to the farm where we were living um, with his uh, birds of prey to do rabbiting, um, he appeared one day and bought my mum and dad <coughs> a baby bar now that had fallen from a nest, <clears throat> it had been handed to him for him to hand rear. Uh, it couldn't be returned to its mother. And he didn't have space or time to look after this baby. So he literally just presented it to my mum and dad. Um, I mean, it, it was, it was, he was so small, so small at the time. Um, so my dad made a barn owl nesting box in the barn for him out of an old tea chest. And that was where he lived. And we called him Archimedes or Archie for short. And he lived in the barn and we had to feed him every day, which was not a particularly nice thing to do because he was living on on chicks. We had this massive bag of chicks that were given to us that, that went in the freezer and we defrost a couple of chicks twice a day uh, to feed him breakfast and dinner. Um, and certainly for the first few weeks, um, Arky was a was a nocturnal nocturnal owl because he was awake during the day and he would sleep at night because he kind of followed the pattern of us. Um, and below this nesting box that my dad had created was a, a big pile of um, straw bales. So you could climb up and be on a level with him. And I, I mean, from, from the moment he arrived, every spare moment I had, I spent sitting in that barn. Um, and bonding with this amazing creature and he would come out onto the edge of his his nesting box onto the little ledge and he would look down and I would wiggle my um, my feet and I had trainers on and he would watch the laces and he would turn his head almost almost entirely um, round he, he was just so dexterous just such an amazing little creature and he would engage with me he had a sense of humor and things like that for him were fun and he would jump down onto the straw bales and attack my shoelaces like they were some vicious creature that he had to finish off um, and he would run around on the straw to start off with he couldn't fly he didn't have um you know he didn't have the the flight feathers developed so he would just run around and then at bedtime I put him back up into the nesting box and he'd go to sleep for the night. Um, but obviously as time went on, he learned to fly. When he first learned to fly, he could only fly in a straight line, which was really amusing to watch. He would just zigzag across the barn to get where he wanted to go. But over time, slowly, he, he obviously learned to, to fly um, incredibly well and became independent. However, he never forgot us. Um, and although he became independent and uh, disappeared off and he'd stopped relying us, um, on us for food, he would still come and visit. Um, and I think a couple of years later, we actually had to leave that farm. And I did go back um, 
maybe a year later and spoke to the owners, the new owners of that farm. And he was still living in the barn and he'd got a wife, a barn owl wife, and they'd had a couple of chicks. So uh, such an amazing uh, experience for me. And he, again, <clears throat> just as Gemma had done previously, it was like he was sent. He just stepped in and, and he gave me such a focus um, and got me through such a difficult time, got me back on my feet. Um, so I'll, I'll always be forever thankful for that amazing experience. But not only the experience of, of having him around, um, but being in that environment, uh, being, being in the middle of nature. I mean, we were surrounded by farmland. There was complete freedom there. Um, there was endless banks of wild flowers. Um, you'd see foxes all the time playing in the fields. And one day we even came across um, a tiny, tiny fawn um, that mum had obviously hidden in the hedge. Mum had gone off foraging and, and had left the fawn in the hedge. And my dad had been out on the tractor and he'd spotted this. So we did creep over and were able to just get a sight of this beautiful, beautiful one or two day old creature in the hedgerow. Um, so really that's where my connection with, with nature started. And also the healing that I received from just being in that environment um, showed me, I mean, I've gone on from there and, and been on a, a huge healing journey and um, experienced lots of, of different modalities. But just being in that environment um, was enough for, to keep me going, to keep me centered, to keep me balanced. Um, and, and help me on my path. And that's really one of the reasons why um, I'm, I'm looking to do something along the lines of creating that environment for others with our Earthkin project is because nature gives so much without asking anything of us. Um, and just purely by being in that environment, we can gain so much. Um, and it's it's one of the things that uh, that it's been. I've been thinking about this today because obviously I knew we were speaking this evening. Um, the, the 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 connection from nature when we're not able to connect with people, which of course you know there's been such a block on that for such a long time now. To be able to connect with nature bring the truly connect with it brings that feeling that you are not alone uh, whether it's a flower that you're connecting with or a wild animal or a tree or even just the clouds um, you know it's, it's all nature um, in the last year um, or certainly the last few years I've had quite a lot of, of grief in my life um, and again this was something I was thinking about today um, the last year particularly has been very difficult losing losing my mum um, and I, I'm not sure how anybody else feels about this but one of the stages certainly that I went through in the very, very early days was um, extreme anger you know looking at, around at other people and thinking how how are you just getting on with your life um, you know, I'm, I'm stuck here and feeling so dreadful and, and life's just going on as normal. And it's, I know it's part of the grieving process, but that brings up, you know, anger and frustration. But I then again turned to nature and just walking uh, every day, walking in the woods and seeing the progression of nature and starting to understand that nothing does stop. There's always this endless cycle. There's always endings and there's always beginnings. And that, again, was really helpful and, and is continuing to be helpful in that healing process. Um, so for me, always going back to nature, it, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a winner every time. So to truly connect with nature, um, I feel it's, it's important because we can go out for a walk and we can, we can look at things and think, oh, well, I'll just look and, and yeah, that's nice, that's a nice tree and, and that's a nice view. But sometimes we can look and we, 
we don't really see we just we don't really stop and connect and that's um, that's the important part to really connect with what you're looking at to really see it um, and not just to listen to nature but to really hear what it's saying to you and of course in order to do that we need to have time we need to give ourselves permission to have that time um, and that is I feel one of the um, one of the positive things that has come from the situation of every be, everybody being forced to stop is that that has allowed people the time to to really just you know you can go for a walk and it doesn't matter if that walk takes you two hours whereas previously you might have only allowed yourself 10 minutes to allow yourself that time is just as important as it is to meditate once a day um, to, to, set, to spend time connecting to your spirit guides it's it's just as important for me to just sit and watch watch the birds um, watching watching birds on the bird table um, it is such a familiar thing it's such a simple thing it's something that so many people do um, and sometimes it's quite hypnotic and we just were watching and we suddenly realized that we're completely away with the fairies and we don't know what we've been thinking about for the last 15 minutes but if you can just if you've got a busy head if you can just watch those birds and really really focus in on what they're doing how they're behaving um, you start to also connect with the comedy side of nature and nature absolutely has a sense of humor um, because birds particularly get up to all sorts and they're really amusing to watch so if you if you allow yourself that time and allow yourself to just bring your focus back to what you're watching rather than going off into that lovely meditative hypnotic state but just to be really mindful of what you're watching you can begin to connect in with the energy um, of that whether it's a, a plant you're watching a plant swaying in, in the wind um, or, or birds feeding um, something else that I, I find really helpful particularly if you're living in a small space I mean it that's the other thing it's all very well someone saying oh you must go and connect to nature but if you live in a tower block um, and you haven't been able to get outside that's not quite so easy but the simple things like having a pot of bulbs that are very very slowly growing and beginning to unfurl watching that change every single day it's a miracle uh, and it's so simple it's something that we I think at times um, I mean it's such a huge generalization but we can often take for granted um, but when you really start to focus in on how a flower grows and how it begins to unfurl and at what point it starts to release a scent at what point you can see what color it's going to be it really is such a miraculous thing um, and again it's it's all about the rhythm and cycle of life and we are nature of course of course we are we're, we're, we're all we're not just connected to nature we are nature okay so um, does anyone want to ask anything before I go on to, to the next part no nope. okay so I just would like to talk briefly about um, the more spiritual side of nature in the sense of or the more spooky side in the sense of elementals and the beings that live um, in the forests and in our gardens and in our pot plants and in the trees outside um, and they are there we might not be able to see them but they are absolutely there and again they are a very playful humorous element to nature mischievous sometimes but if you are able to find some time and just sit 
um, either in a park or in the woods or in your garden and just focus on a tree sit enough distance away so that you can see the whole of the tree um, looking at the aura of a tree is actually one of the best things if you're starting to look into being able to see auras the tree aura is really easy to see um, so if you just sit and focus on the on the um, the top of the tree you will begin to see a slight white fuzzy line around the top of the tree and that's that's the aura emanating from the tree but you also once you start to see that you may start to see a few little sparkly bits appear and that's the elementals coming out to play and they do live in every um, tree plant shrub they're always there so if you are moving something uh, digging a plant up or if you've got to chop a bit of a tree down or a whole tree down um, I always feel it's really important to connect to the elementals that are living in and looking after that particular tree to just let them know why this is happening what's going to be happening and make your suggestion that they move into another tree it's just a polite thing to do I think um, and I remember Anne when I was living um, next door to you and that willow tree had to come down out of the garden um, I don't know if you remember this but it was very old and very rotten and it was causing quite a lot of problems unfortunately um, with drainage <laughs> in the garden and it, it was advised by the tree surgeons that really the best thing was for it to come down and I remember you saying to me and when I was in floods of tears about this tree being removed that I really needed to go and talk to the elementals and just explain what was happening so I did go and do that but I did have to come inside so that I didn't watch the tree be chopped down because I, I couldn't face I couldn't face watching it. Okay, so um, the other thing that um, I think that we miss a society we miss out a, a lot on because of the way that we have lived our lives and continue to live our lives is the is the seasons and the rhythms and cycles of nature. Um, there is a time uh, there is a time for everything in nature and sometimes we're trying to do something and it's just not the right time um, autumn and particularly winter is often not a time to be pushing things because winter is a time when you focus on nature it's a time of rest it's a time of recuperation it's a time of reflection um, so during that period that phase of the year we really should be connecting in with the rhythm of that season rather than trying to push 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 but of course society doesn't take too much notice of the rhythm and, and seasons um, but if it's possible it's a really good idea to try and live as much in tune with nature as you can so that is the time when we should automatically be slightly in hibernation mode ourselves and not pushing at things and then of course we come into the springtime where there's a stirring and there's a stirring in the ground in the earth and we know that things are starting to move we start to see the signs that actually although over that winter period everything may have looked very dead and dormant um, things have still been going on and spring for me is, is very much a time of, of, of sowing the seeds of, of what you'd like to bring through in that year um, both physically planting seeds out but also metaphorically planting seeds for the things that you want to bring into your life um, but if you if you just compare for a moment if you have sowed some seeds let's say we've sowed some tomato seeds um, and we check them every couple of days has it has anything started sprouting through yet 
give them some water and we talk to them and give them lots of love and we keep checking and checking has anything come through yet but what we don't do or what we shouldn't do is just move that earth and dig them up are you sprouting i've got to know if you're sprouting or not we don't do that we trust that that tomato seed is going to spread Sorry about that. I completely uh, disappeared. The whole thing went off, but it's back yes. on. Yes, yeah, you, you're back on track now. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Don't panic us like that, darling. Don't care <laughs> it, it didn't even give any warning. The screen just went completely blank. We had, we had, we had Elizabeth instead, but that was all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, tomato seeds. That's what I was talking about. Not digging up your tomato seed. So when you are sowing a seed of an idea or a plan or a thought, um, and I'm not, I'm not brilliant at this, I have to say, but just trusting that you've planted that seed, now just leave it under cover and know that it will sprout. If it's meant to sprout, it will sprout. You don't have to keep digging it up <laughs> and checking to see if it's sprouting. <laughs> So again, it's, it's, the, everything just comes back to, to nature for me, particularly when it comes to the seasons. And um, I mean, the summertime, of course, is, is a, a, a busy time and it's a time of, um, of action and activity, but it's also the beginning of reaping the harvest of, of what you've sown. Um, and then moving into autumn, which when it's really the time when we're we're really collecting in and gathering around us everything that we have nurtured, and beginning to make plans for that quieter time of year where we're going to start slowing down again and taking stock of everything that's happened. Um, am I still here? Yeah, I am. Sorry, it keeps going a bit funny. You can hear me? Yes, you're fine, darling. Okay, okay. Okay, um, so has anyone got any questions? I've lost the chat thing. No, the chat's there. No, okay. 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 Actually, something else that um, I just wanted to mention, because I, I find this often when I'm, um, when I'm doing a, a treatment for somebody is that um, melatonin which is the sleep brain chemical um, is quite often out of balance with people and we start to naturally produce melatonin when um, when the sun goes down so as soon as we're out of daylight and, and sunlight stops hitting our eyes our brain begins to produce melatonin which should start to make us feel sleepy and the whole time it's dark we are producing melatonin which should help to keep us asleep all through the night however we of course now live in this age of um, artificial lighting we've all got phones we've all got tablets we've all got e-readers we've all got laptops and artificial light can really knock out the balance of melatonin so if struggling with sleep is something that happens um, for you it's a really good idea to switch off anything with artificial lighting a good couple of hours before you go to bed and I know that's not very easy because we're kind of conditioned now, aren't we, to always be looking at something, um, whether it's a... Sorry, I'll answer that in a sec, Trina, sorry, and Annette. Um, yeah, it's really important to put, put those things away. And even if you try, just try it. If you're struggling to sleep, just try having the last hour before you go to bed um by using candlelight because that's a much much softer light and it does not stop our body producing melatonin in the same way that artificial lighting does 
Mm. So it's just worth trying that if you're someone that, that struggles um, with sleep. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Trina, I think our false lockdown has meant we are missing the season. Don't you recall the beginning of winter? Um, I haven't noticed that, Trina, but then um, I guess, I mean, that's another thing that when we're living in an artificial environment in the sense that we've got central heating, um, so we're, you know, we just crank the heating up. We don't necessarily notice that oh the temperature's changing whereas if we were living where we had to build a fire in it in order to keep warm um we would start to notice a bit more so i don't know for me i didn't particularly notice that but then i've i'm i suppose i'm always connecting in with what nature's doing um one of the things that i really loved actually about living in the new forest when i was there was every bit of of the year there was something different to see um and winter time uh, i absolutely loved in the forest i mean i know it's it's not particularly popular time of year but um there was always something different happening on the forest i mean they used to release the pigs autumn time so they'd still be around in the winter and that was always fantastic to watch the piggies running around over the forest um, and all the frost, particularly if you go out early in the morning, all the beautiful frost patterns um, and icicles and, and yeah, ponds icing over and things like that. So um, it, that was a really fantastic place actually to be. So I, yeah, I, 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 I have to say, Trina, I hadn't really, I hadn't really noticed um, that it stopped me from connecting with the seasons. Um, yeah, just said it even more so for me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I because I think we've had more time to to stop and tune in and connect with the seasons. So, yeah, yeah. And that asks about um, tree divas. If you could um, tree divas. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. And if you've got any play about um uh the water spirits as well because we've got lots of yeah okay uh, so I, i've got um i've got a big kind of confession here because i don't know um on a reading level um particularly anything about tree divas or water divas I only know because I'm not very good at retaining information. So I can read something and I can read a whole book and I might remember three words from that book and the rest goes somewhere else. So my only knowledge of the Divic Kingdom is what I, um, what I perceive for myself. Um, so when I go and, and connect with a tree, um, or go and look in a pond. My intention is that I want to connect with whatever's there that wants to connect with me. Um, so I don't know what being it is particularly that I might be communicating with. I don't have a name for it. Um, and I really don't mean that in any disrespectful way that, um, that I'm not, you know, naming what it is I'm communicating with. For me, it's, um, it, it's all the same thing. It's all love. Um, it's just in different vibrations and different energy. And um, I mean, I've read um, the, the Gentleman and the Fawn, which is about um, connecting with, with, with Pan, you know, the kind of king of, of the elementals and the, and the Divic kingdom. And, um, and, I, and I completely have absolute faith that that's all there. But for me, um, it's not that I'm particularly connecting with any one entity or any one being. It's, it's the collective, the collective from nature. So um, that, that's, that's my feeling on that, Annette. I hope that's <laughs> it's not really answered anything. But um, I mean, that's, if you've not, I'm sure you have read that book, actually, Annette. But if you haven't, it's a really good one to read. I've just put the name up for everybody. Oh, right. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. Absolutely it's beautiful. A delightful book. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a delightful book. Yeah, it really is. It's a lovely book. Yeah, so the thing is, Debs, if you, <clears throat> not everybody Lisa. is so psychically uh, uh, in tune that they, they could pick out a particular diva, or, but if they hold that in their intention that they're going to connect to the spirit of the tree no matter what form that comes in they will it's not it's that intention it's that intention isn't it yeah i just want to share with you uh what something i said to you uh, uh, earlier i said to tony you know, look at that gorse bush now to me the gorse bush was like vibrating at me and the colors and the light on it were amazing and i said to tony look look at the gorse bush he said yeah yeah i saw it and i thought no you didn't actually didn't actually well you might have seen it but you didn't feel it yeah and, it and that's the thing it's feeling it isn't yeah, it yeah, absolutely yeah. and and it's um for, for me that is such a, a gift is such an enormous gift and it's something that's so simple it is such simplicity in nature it's not anything fancy it doesn't cost any money you can just go and do it and it's the most enormous gift just watching as i was saying i've got oh, she's gone again you've gone debs <laughs> Hopefully she'll come back. I think back. I've got more to try in this, in this laptop. You're back. You're okay. You're back now. <laughs> I think the naughty sprite keeps turning my video off. Debs, can I ask you a question? Do you, do, do you think that, the, that this business of connecting is a, a lot about opening your heart as much as anything else and your, and your mind in a way to, to just put aside the 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 practicals and the yes that it, it looks it's, it's a, like Tony and the, and the gorse bush yes it is a gorse bush of course it's a gorse bush and you've seen lots of them but <clears throat> it's that it's that what we're doing in, con, in being conscious it's all about being conscious and and being open and maybe if we all go for our next walk with our minds open and our hearts yeah, open absolutely. with the intention of feeling nature a bit more than just seeing it yeah yeah and i've put that in the meditation actually with the hope that you know if it's something that you that you struggle with purely because you're you know your head's full of something else you've got so many things on your mind um and this is absolutely something that happens to me quite quite often particularly at the moment so i really have to force myself to just go right just shut up a minute i'm just going to come back into my heart and allow myself to just receive what i need to receive from nature um and just just i mean sometimes you do have to give yourself a bit of a slap to make you it's not something that happens automatically because we are so caught up in in the world and everything that's going on but if you can really poke yourself or slap yourself <laughs> oh, i could slap tony too <laughs> absolutely um then it, the joy that comes from that is just yeah. absolutely immense so yeah i've, I've put that in the, in the meditation actually Brilliant. Um, because it's really important. Sorry, I just saw that Elizabeth. So yeah, Elizabeth said about being more in touch, and Sashi said, "Moon phase is affecting me more." So, yes, absolutely. Um, the the phases of the moon. Uh, I never used to really take very much notice. I have to say, until I worked at the um, at the, the animal sanctuary in the jungle in Sri Lanka. And um, the full moon is called Poya Day there. And it's a, you know, it's a day every month um, that everybody goes to the temple and nobody wants to do any work. And um, they serve beer in teapots on the beaches because they're not supposed to drink alcohol on Poya Day. So they serve it in teapots. <laughs> so Poya Day was a big thing. So you always knew when the full moon was without, it wasn't something I'd really sort of thought about too much before but there it became very obvious because there was a, a marked day every month but what I did begin to notice that was for three days either side of the full moon 
the dogs in the sanctuary would be even more frenetic. Mm, Absolutely. Um, and also then I started to notice that the staff that worked at the sanctuary, myself included, would also be slightly more fren frenetic around the full moon. Um, and of course, the, you know, I started to sort of read, read a bit more about it and discovered that the word lunatic, <laughs> of course, does come because of, of the moon. And the fact that when the moon is full, it has such, I mean, it's going to have an effect on us. It's, it, it affects the water um, on the earth plane. And we are, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're majority water in our bodies. So it's going to have a huge effect on us. And I think it is something that I've become much more aware of. Um, and you're absolutely right, Sashi. I think particularly during this lockdown, it's become even more obvious that that full moon time of the month um, is really a good time to kind of hide <laughs> because the, the whole, you know, the whole energy, all the energies that are going on astrologically um, at the moment, it just seems to magnify everything when that, when that moon is full. So yeah, I've, I've noticed that too. <laughs> good time <Yeah>. to hide. <laughs> yeah. And my dog, like Sasha's dog, I've got a dog that's a bit highly strong. <clears throat> she goes bad around the full moon, and, and I know it's the full moon now because she gets very needy and very not stressed particularly. Well, maybe stressed, but she's 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 highly emotional. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, it does. It has a huge effect, doesn't it? Mm. And animals are great teachers um, for that. You know, just observing them, just watching watching their behaviour. Um, something else, actually, not particularly moon related, but something else that I really noticed um, at, the, at the sanctuary was was learning a lot about forgiveness and acceptance and the ability to move on, because the dogs would be uh, particularly around feeding time. Um, a big frenzied frenetic energy and fights would break out and suddenly there'd be this huge Wah! between two dogs um and you'd think oh my god they're gonna kill each other i've got to go and sort this out and separate them and get my arm ripped open in the process which happened a few times but five minutes later it's all forgotten and they're waggy and they're friends again and they're hanging out together and you're kind of st still left reeling from all this energy that's just happened, but they just completely go back to normal and get on with it. And it, it really taught me a lot, actually, about the kind of drama that happens and how we can, we get so, as human beings, we get so stuck in she did this and he did that. And animals just don't do that. They just, have their big Barney and then they just get over it. They're really good at letting go. <laughs> so yeah. I would recommend working in an animal sanctuary as a helpful process for helping you to learn to let go of things quickly. <laughs> and they don't blame, do they? No, no judgment at all. No. I mean, that's the other thing with nature, of course, isn't it? There's no judgment in nature and we don't judge nature. You know, we don't look at a, 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 a flower and think, oh, you're not as tall as the one next door to you. You know, you look a bit stumpy or a bit stunted. We just admire it. You know, we don't look at a tree and, and think, oh, that it's got one arm longer than the other. There must be something wrong with it. We just we just embrace it. And yeah, absolutely. Humans have got a lot to learn from, you know, from, from wildlife and and from the plants about embracing what we see as imperfection because there isn't any imperfection. No, I think that the other thing that I noticed, Deb, so I don't know whether you feel that what I say to Tony sometimes, the dog, the dogs are being dog. And that's just <laughs> what they are. They're just being dog. They're not, yeah. they're not doing anything deliberate. And it's like the horses out on the forest, you know, they're just being themselves. They're not, they're not putting on an act. They're not got into an ego. They're, they're just being what they are. And that's another thing I think we can learn from. from Absolutely. Making. Absolutely. Uh, one of our dogs, Paws, the female, is, um, I mean, she just does exactly what she likes, whenever she likes. 
And sometimes I look at her and think it must be so lovely to be that uninhibited. She just doesn't care. She doesn't care what anybody thinks about her. Um, she just lets go, literally, <laughs> quite often. She, I mean, she'll lie on her back with her legs akimbo and she just doesn't care. And she's she's just a, a really happy soul and it there is such a a thing for us to learn i think from watching watching animals absolutely because we're so worried all the time aren't we so rigid and you know we're always thinking too much um and yes, yeah, and, I, yeah I, and we sometimes bring that into the way we are with animals because we want to train them and control them. You know, you, the way mankind has worked with animals. I mean, mm. we're getting better now, but there, there was a time we either wanted to kill them and eat them or, or control them. At least now we're allowing animals to be themselves along mm. Mm. and living in a better condition. I think that's that's an overall thing that's that's happened that that man in general has tried to beat nature you know everything is about let's beat nature well why do you want to beat it why don't you use it harness the power of it and work with it because you'll go so much further mm -hmm. it's not a competition um and and nature always has an answer always it's just if we take the time to stop and connect with that and listen to that, which is another thing that I wanted to do in with the meditation, um, that it always it always has the answer. Um, it's just that we, I suppose that's ego, isn't it? We, you know, there's this this you know this science has has beaten. Uh, beat nature in some way you know because it's come up with this amazing new thing um, but actually if you were to start looking at how nature deals with that problem then and follow that path and work with it rather than against it um, for all our you know I mean that goes for all our power needs you know uh, nature's got it all we just need to connect with that and 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 harness that and use it rather than destroying it but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a question, Debs? Um, there's, I've read, and I haven't actually done it myself, but I've heard that you can get, um, you can speak to, uh, um, like the queen bee or uh, uh, the king bee, yeah. yeah, and get um, them to actually move on absolutely like, have you ever done anything like that no no i'm a bit rubbish actually um i've tried a couple of times i tried it with the rats um but i, I just seem to fail miserably but there's a really good book i think i will have to check um i'm not sure where that book is at the moment i think it's just called talking with nature but an amazing uh chap wrote this book and he had he was in australia lived in australia and he had a real issue with either kangaroos or wallabies and he bought this land and he had part of this land that he needed for cattle grazing and either these kangaroos or these wallabies were coming in and destroying parts of that um now the people that he bought the land from used to shoot them but he didn't want to do that so he, I think he drew a map of the land and he put a circle around on the map. He put a circle around the area where he did not want them to come. And then he connected in. He, his intention was to connect in with the king of the kangaroos or the wallabies that were in this area. And he asked for them to respect that boundary line. And that if they respected and stayed outside of that, they could have all the food or the area that they wanted. It was just that bit that he needed and he explained why he needed it to keep his cattle. Um, and it worked perfectly. I think a few years later, um, he sold the land on. And of course, the people that came next did not have this agreement. Right. So they started to encroach on the land. And then the person that was had the land started to shoot them. 
So the more they were being shot, the more they were coming in because they were trying to, you know, they were just butting up against. But I do know um, my friend had an awful problem with slugs coming into her kitchen and they were coming in under the kitchen sink through the drainage pipe somewhere. Um, and she would come and make a, you know, fill up the kettle in the morning and there'd be this huge slug sitting in her sink, which is not very nice. Um, so she actually sat and had a conversation and she asked to connect with the king of the slugs um, and asked them to, again, she, she, she put up a boundary and said they were really welcome to stay there, to stay outside. Um, and, and that worked perfectly. And actually, I, having said it's not really worked for me, I, I do wonder if it did because we had a terrible problem when we first bought our cottage in Brittany. It was full of holes. The roof was falling in um, and we had rats living in the in the, the kind of upstairs part. Um, I mean, it was so bad at one point. They wake us up every night boinging about up there, um, sounding like they could have a party. And we tried everything. We tried all the natural methods. Um, and everybody said, oh, you've got to put peppermint oil on cotton wool balls and that'll, that'll scare them right away. They won't like that. Well, our rats loved it. They took all the cotton wool and made nests with it. So that didn't work at all. And we tried, um, I, I made Tom, sorry, Tom, but I made Tom pee in a spray bottle because human, male human urine is supposed to be quite off-putting when you're trying to keep something away. So I was up there spraying that around and that didn't make any difference at all. And I did, I did talk to them. I did, I've forgotten that. I did connect in and talk to them and ask to speak to the king of the rats. Now, whether that coincided, it's all a, kind of a bit hazy, whether that coincided with us blocking up the holes. Um, but they did, they did move out. Mm. Um, and were just, they were just living outside in the chicken area, which was fine. I, I had no issue with that. Um, it was when they were living in the house, it was a problem. I think it works if you work not from fear or desperation. I think it's like anything when you put out an intention. Uh, yeah. The vibration of it has to be high. So you're doing it from a, like that man with the wallabies. He was doing it from a high vibration. Yeah. If you're doing it um, from a fearful situation, I, think, I, I honestly think it can work. And I, I have done it, but, but you know, only with ants and things. I haven't done it with any, uh, any much bigger than that. Somebody here saying they've done it with moles. Annette's done it with moles. Oh, fantastic. Did it work, Annette? <laughs> you can unmute Annette. If yes, you yes, it did, actually. It's a case of you, you, to, to get their attention, you need to stamp your feet around the mole hill. And then you say, well, what I did was say, please leave my garden. You've got the whole forest to yourself. And I was lucky because my neighbor had about 20 molehills. And I did tell her to do this, but she thought I was crackers. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> I've just seen Flora. Hi, Flora. I can't see you, but I've just seen you put a question. I didn't know you were here. Um, tried speaking to the deer, nothing doing. Well, try again, try again. Maybe we'll do this meditation in a moment and, yeah. and maybe try um, doing that after you've done a meditation similar to this so I that you're... To them very kindly, very gently, very spiritually almost, you know, um, but they're still here. They just, uh, they just ignore you. <laughs> but they, they, perhaps that's that sense of humour coming back in again. It's not helpful though, is it? <laughs> Maybe try that, Flora. Maybe try drawing a diagram of your garden and then draw a circle, draw a boundary um, and try and send the energy of, of that boundary being, you know, the space that you would like to keep. Uh, but outside of that space, they're welcome to everything. Yes, I think you don't want to say, I wish. You want to say, thank you for visiting me. I don't want to sit an hour's time for you to go right now. Very, mm. like, decisive about it. Okay. If, let's do your meditation. That would be beautiful. Unless anybody's got any more questions. 
That would be really lovely. I can't wait. Anybody else got any questions? Oh, there's Andrea sharing about a poem. Being human. Oh, that's it. That's the name of the book. Thanks, Sashi. Talking with nature. That's a lovely book. Mm. Uh, and Andrea said about a poem being human. Oh, okay. Thank you, Andrea. I'll Google that. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Right. I'm going to get on and do this meditation, but Anne's disappeared off, so I'll just wait until I, she comes. Sorry, I, there's a book that I wanted to share the name of, but I'll look for it later and send it out on an email, because there was a lovely book I read about um, a man who could actually see the divas, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pass that message on as well. Okay, darling, it's all over to you. I've never, I've never seen, um, I've, I've just seen the kind of, you know the, the sparkly bits um so not a specific but um i have seen quite a few photographs in fact in recent months um my brother um and my nieces have all been taking photographs when they've been out on walks and there's been quite a few in those so um it's almost like i don't know whether that is a nature spirit or it's it's something else just someone so. um you know wonderful. someone Oh, Elizabeth, yeah, you've seen a fairy. I've seen you an do. elf. I've seen an elf. Have you? Yes. Uh, uh, well, were you there when we went to, um, oh, God, where were the stones? Uh, Stonehenge. And there were elves or something like elves there. And uh, they were a bit, they were a bit, <laughs> they were a bit tricky. They yeah, they bit, can be quite but, naughty, can't yeah, they? Yeah, they can, yeah. Yeah, I know, quite mischievous energy. But uh, yeah, I remember seeing Elizabeth. Do you want to just really quickly say about your fairy because this is such a lovely story? Ah, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I phoned Debbie in. in uh, she was the first person I spoke to. I was like, Debbie, Debbie, do you, really, you won't believe this. I was living in Livington, and I was cooking at the cooker. And beside me, there was an archway that went down a passageway to my treatment room. And there, standing in the doorway, life-size, was this girl just kind of doing this. And she had brown hair, and she was wearing kind of green. But although, she, and I've never seen ghosts, never seen anything like that. Uh, I do not see. But it was so obvious to me that she was fairy energy. Even though we, we think of fairies as being really small, she was life-size. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I just knew it was a fairy. I have absolutely no idea why she was there. I've no idea what it was about, but she just kind of stood there, went like that, and then she vanished. And I phoned Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Who else would you call? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, right. So we'll um we'll we'll go on and do a meditation if everyone's ready. Lovely. Yes, please. Okay, I really hope I don't disappear again, but I, I seem to be able to get straight back on again if I do disappear. Okay, so if you just get yourself comfortable and try and have your feet on the floor in front of you and just close your eyes. And take three nice deep breaths in and out. Feel your shoulders relaxing and feel your feet on the floor growing heavy, so heavy that when you try to lift them, you can't. And in your mind, Imagine yourself walking along a track in the countryside. It's a beautiful day and the weather is a perfect temperature.
As you walk along, you notice a gate in the hedgerow beside you. Open this gate and step through into a meadow. As you close the gate behind you, just slip off your shoes and feel the grass between your toes, the earth beneath your feet. And walk through this meadow. And you come to an area where there's trees. Maybe there's a stream babbling in the distance. You can hear the birds singing. And when you breathe in, you inhale the beautiful scents of summer. Walk over now to the closest tree and stand next to it. Again, focus on your feet, standing on the soft, warm earth. And feel roots growing out of your feet, down into the earth below. Feel those roots growing further down, connecting with the root of the tree you're standing beside, connecting deep down into the heart of the earth. Start to feel the pulsing energy of the center of our beautiful mother earth. Feel that energy rise, back up the roots, into your feet, beautiful swirling colours, earthy brown, red, green, yellow and white, swirling up through your feet, your legs, your torso, up through your chest, down your arms, and into your head. Feel that beautiful, vibrant, strong energy pulsing through every cell of your being, And feel it pushing now from the inside, the center of your chest, pushing open the doors of your heart and feel it then bursting through those doors and that light, that connection running through you and out through your heart centre, touching everything around you. Feel your heart open, open to receive whatever message nature wishes to bring you. Lift your arms to the sky and just stay here for a few moments, looking around this beautiful meadow, 
and just notice what's happening around you. Maybe there's a ladybird on a flower beneath your feet. Maybe a bird has landed on a branch of the tree. Maybe the wind has got up and the clouds are moving slightly faster. Just stay here for a few moments and notice what may come to you. As you stand here, connected fully to Mother Earth, just take a moment to send gratitude from your heart to all the beauty, the light, the joy that surrounds you. and send a message of thanks and love down through your feet, through those roots into the centre of this beautiful earth and thank her for all she brings. When you are ready, begin to make your way back across the meadow to the gate. Slip your shoes back onto your feet and open the gate. Step through back into the countryside lane and close the gate behind you. And begin to make your way back into the now. Rub your hands together and rub your feet on the floor in front of you. And when you are ready, you can open your eyes. I'm going to take over now. Before you come back fully into consciousness, I'd like to ask a favour of you. I'd like you to join me in an intention, an intentions app for Debs and Tom. And I'd like you to use your skills of manifesting and the power of intention 
to visualize Tom and Debbie in their new home on a beautiful piece of land and starting their Earthkin project. See Debbie furiously chasing that bee to rescue it. See Tom feeding the squirrel that was rescued. See them building the yurts for the visitors. See nature blooming in this beautiful space that they have created. And we're seeing it happening now. that beautiful, beautiful place that may be, may just be that meadow that we've just visited. And we call on nature now to help us manifest this beautiful place, this place of repose and serenity, place of healing and a place of recovery for humans and for nature. And we thank nature, mother nature, Pan, all the divas and the elementals for helping us create this dream come true. And I thank you for participating in this creation with Debs and Tom. Couldn't be in better hands. And we're all going to come along and annoy you there. <laughs> Bless you, Deb. Thank, Thank you, you so much for a fabulous, fabulous talk. I can't wait to get out on my walk tomorrow. I'm going to make everybody sit still. The dogs and I just have to sit still. <laughs> and I'm going to commune with nature completely and utterly tomorrow. If anybody's got any more questions, please, you can unmute yourself now. I'll put you back into gallery view. And I want to make a big thank you for Deb's. Thank you. <laughs> that was lovely, Deb. Thank you, darling. That was really lovely.